Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing hemostasis. Okay, so we're currently in the process of discussing the production of a fibrin mesh work that intertwines among the platelets of the platelet plug uh, to strengthen it into what we will then call a hemostatic plug, which will do the job of plugging this hole in the wall of the blood vessel and preventing blood from leaving the circulatory system and going into uh, the external tissue fluid. Okay, so we've seen one pathway so far for how you can initiate this conversion of fibrinogen into a fibrin mesh, uh, which is the intrinsic pathway. We're now going to have a look at the other one, which is the extrinsic pathway. So the first thing we need to understand is how is this initiated? In the case of the intrinsic pathway, we had Hageman factor or factor 12, uh, which became its active form when it came into contact with either collagen or the surface of activated platelets, which was the key giveaway sign that something was wrong. That was what initiated the entire intrinsic pathway. So what is it that's going to initiate the extrinsic pathway? Well, the extrinsic pathway is going to be initiated when coagulation factor 7 comes into contact with a coagulation factor that it would never normally be allowed to see. And this one is one of the few ones that isn't actually uh, produced by the liver and secreted into the bloodstream. Instead, it's produced by all cells all around the body, okay, uh, except the endothelial cells, which don't have it on their apical membranes. Uh, and it is a marker uh, of being uh, a poor, well, being an area of tissue outside of the circulatory system, and this is coagulation factor three. Okay, also called tissue factor. So let me firstly just introduce you to coagulation factor three or tissue factor, and then we'll come back to coagulation factor seven, which is a more normal uh, coagulation factor. So coagulation factor three, as I say, this is produced by all cells all over the body. So loads of cells all over the body produce uh, tissue factor. The important thing is that the endothelial cells of the bloodstream do not have it on their apical cell membranes. Okay, so on the portion of the cell membrane that faces into the lumen of the blood vessel, you will not have tissue factor. Okay, so factor 7, which is a more normal coagulation factor, which is just circulating in the bloodstream, does not usually ever see any uh, tissue factor at all. Okay. The other strange thing about tissue factor is that it doesn't have an inactive and an active state, so it's a strange coagulation factor, it's different from all of the other ones, okay? It's just coagulation factor free, there's not free A. Okay, so cells that are outside of the circulatory system, these will have on their surface lots and lots of tissue factor molecules, so this is a picture here of tissue factor. So. Normally, coagulation factor 7, which is a normal one produced by the liver and has two forms, the inactive and the active form, it would never normally ever be allowed to see tissue factor. It would go around inside the lumen of the blood vessel and it would never see tissue factor because the endothelial cells uh, do not have tissue factor on their apical surface and all uh, factor 7 sees is what is on the apical surface of the endothelial cells. Then when it goes into this hole in the side of the blood vessel, it's going to come into contact with all of the cells in the deeper portions of the blood vessel wall. Okay, so you drill this hole into the uh, blood vessel, it's now going to uh, well, factor 7 here, when it comes through that hole, it's going to come into contact with all of the cells that line at the boundary of the hole uh, as it's going through it. And those cells, the cells that are further back in the vessel wall, they will have tissue factor on their surface. So now factor 7 will come into contact with uh, factor 3. And what happens is it's going to bind to uh, factor 3 here. So here it comes, here is factor 7 binding to factor 3, and it forms a complex with it that also requires calcium. So factor 7 is another one of these coagulation factors that has gamma carboxyglutamate residues in it. And in order to bind to the uh, phospholipid bilayer of these cells, it needs calcium ions there. So again, this is where calcium ions are becoming important here. Okay, 
Uh, so factor 7 forms this complex with tissue factor and calcium ions, and now what will happen is 7 will be uh, changed to its active form now. So in this complex, 7 will go on to form 7A. So you're now going to have this complex involving factor 3, factor 7A, and calcium. And what is this complex now going to do? Well, it's going to act as an activator of 10 in the same way as the 10 A's that we had over here um, acted as an activator of factor 10. And in fact, some people actually call this 10 A's that we had here the intrinsic 10 A's, the 10 A's of the intrinsic pathway, and they will call this complex that we've got here the 10 A's of the extrinsic pathway, or the extrinsic 10 A's. But uh, that's just terminology. The important bit here is that what it's going to do is it's going to take inactivated factor 10, or if you prefer, inactivated Stuart factor, and it's going to activate it to activated factor 10. And then the exact same thing is then going to happen that happened after this step of the intrinsic pathway. Now factor 10A is going to combine with factor 5A and calcium ions to form a complex on the surface of the activated platelets, which will function as a prothrombinase. Then prothrombin, with the help of calcium, will bind to activated platelet surfaces, and then will be activated by the prothrombinase to thrombin, and it will then start acting on fibrinogen molecules, converting them into fibrin monomers, which will then assemble into fibrin fibers spontaneously in amongst the platelets of the platelet plug, and then uh, thrombin will also activate factor 13 that's drifting about into 13A, which will then cross-link uh, the um, fibrin polymers into a fibrin mesh. So this is just a different initiation, and then it's the exact same pathway after that. Okay, so that then is the extrinsic pathway complete. It's another way then of activating this conversion of fibrinogen into a fibrin mesh. Okay, so we have now completed then our discussion of hemostasis. This is what has happened overall. Um, when we had this blood vessel with a hole in the side of it, two major things happen to produce hemostasis. One, you get the vasoconstriction, and remember we know why that occurs. The platelets, when they're activated, start releasing those molecules, serotonin and thromboxane A2, which are going to cause the vasoconstriction of the blood vessel to reduce blood flow through it to try and reduce hemorrhage. In addition, there's going to be the coagulation process, which is going to produce us this hemostatic plug, more commonly just called a blood clot, although I've explained to you why you should be cautious of calling it a blood clot. You should probably add the word physiological in front of that to distinguish it from a pathological blood clot. Uh, it's going to form this hemostatic plug in the hole in the side of the blood vessel, and that's going to consist of two main components. The platelets that have activated will then aggregate and form a beautiful uh, interconnected uh, mush of platelets in that hole. And to give that strength, we've then got uh, the intrinsic and extrinsic cascades here, uh, which are resulting in the conversion of this inactive protein fibrinogen into the active fibrin monomer, which then assembles into these fibrin meshes. Okay, and that's going to form this spider's web that will intertwine with the platelets to give it some strength. Okay, so to add this onto this picture here, what you're now going to have is loads and loads of fibrin everywhere, giving this a huge amount of strength, and that's what's going to make it solid and hard and uh, during. Okay, and that's then the coagulation process complete. We now have uh, filled this hole in the side of our blood vessel which we had injured. Okay, we will have a break here. It's a natural place to have a break. Uh, in the next video, what we will talk about, because we're not going to end the hemostasis video here yet, in the next video, what we're going to talk about is bleeding disorders. So we'll talk about hemophilia, we'll also talk about liver disease, and we'll also talk about vitamin K deficiency and why those are all going to result in problems with the hemostasis process.